so in the in lectures 5 and 6a we studied basic properties of linear vector spaces and linear maps and in this lecture we are going to add an additional structure into a vector space called an inner product which just means that you can associate a length if you wish to every vector and so spaces linear vector spaces with an inner product will be called inner product spaces and this is what we're going to study in this lecture and this is important because in physics applications most often we have inner product spaces and not just vector spaces so as always we'll begin with two with two examples and uh, so that we can get an idea what we mean by an inner product so let's start with usual vectors that is uh, now we know that we can think of them as elements of r3 and so if you're given a vector u that is just a column vector with entries u1 u2 u3 we can associate a length usually it's denoted by modulus of u to it and how is that defined it's just the sum of the squares of the components of the vector so in this case it's u1 square plus u2 square plus u3 square a closely related object is the dot or scalar product of two vectors so let we already have u which is one vector so I take a second vector and we write this u dot v which is u1 v1 plus u2 v2 plus u3 v3 this is something which we we know very well the second example which was uh, which we which we actually know is the uh, is the one on the polarization vector so there we saw that uh, you know there was a complex vector uh, which is a uh, cal e which was had two components now i'm just calling it one and two cal epsilon one e1 and e2 and uh, the length of this vector is uh, given like this it's mod of uh, again cal e square which is modulus of epsilon one square plus modulus of epsilon two square remember epsilon one and epsilon two are complex in this case so we need to do this complex conjugation so this is very important and uh, how did we see this before because when we studied the time average energy density it was actually one by two epsilon naught times this quantity okay so the length was implicitly there not explicitly but so now we have two examples of vectors which naturally appear in physics and now our goal is to generalize this to arbitrary vector spaces and so we need to be a little formal again the properties will be obvious but uh, uh, so let us just go ahead and look at it so the inner product generalizes the notion of dot product of vectors to arbitrary linear vector spaces several of its properties follows from the two examples that we just saw so now u and v are just two vectors in some arbitrary linear vector space over some field f what does the inner product do it has two entries so u is the first entry and v it takes these two number these two vectors and output is an, a scalar okay and now of course since it takes two entries we can also uh, we can also make both of them identical so we call u u it's the square of the norm of the vector u and uh, the convention is to put two uh, two bars rather than one bar like we did here and uh, so and that is just definition of the uh, this thing this is called the norm of the vector u and uh, the key point here is that it uh, even if the field were complex this takes values in reals and this is something which we saw here that even though epsilon 1 epsilon 2 were complex we saw that uh, the length of this vector was something which was positive definite and that sort of made sense when we understood that as energy density Every, uh, I mean we expect this to be a positive quantity and uh, so this is what it says yeah, so even for the field uh, complex fields this is uh, not just a real number but it's a real number which is positive positive definite so now we will state its properties and simple exercise so that you just get familiar with these properties is to go back to the scalar or the dot product and check that it satisfies all these properties okay and uh, actually you can go back here and we know the generalizations so instead of looking at uh, r3 we could do rn and similarly we could do cn and you i'm sure you can guess what the corresponding inner products will be so yeah, so we'll start with uh, 
u, v, and w are three vectors in a linear vector space over C. We'll do it for complex, but for the reals, uh, it will be the same. I mean, the, the, all these properties go through, and you, I will explain that they are different. And A and B are complex numbers. So the first point is that there's conjugation symmetry. So remember, it takes two arguments, V and U. And uh, that is equal to, if you exchange the two arguments, which you're doing here, that's a complex conjugate of it. So I could put the star here or here. So this complex conjugation is something which is uh, extra element when you work over complex numbers. It just takes uh, a complex number to its complex conjugate. So x plus iy will go to x minus iy. If you think of a complex number z, which is x plus iy, real and imaginary parts, you know, hopefully you remember that. So that's what. Uh, so if it's over c, it just says that v u equal to u v star does nothing. And so that just means that it doesn't matter what is the first. It is symmetric in its two arguments. Now comes the interesting point, that uh, uh, which makes use of, you know, a key point of linear vector spaces is linearity, and it's linear in its second order. So here's what one means by this, uh, that uh, first I uh, fix the first entry as u, some constant vector, and the second one is a linear combination of v and w, with r, where a and b are arbitrary scalars. And that just says that this is equal to a times uv plus b times inner product of u with w. This is just the property. Now, again, there will be differences between physics notation and math notation. So in most math books, inner products are defined to be linear in the first argument. And we follow a convention that is followed in quantum mechanics in just about all of physics. And now, the positivity of norm, that means if you put both the entries to be the same, we get something that uh, uh, that this has to be greater than or equal to zero. If you just go back and look at the conjugation symmetry, conjugation is short for complex conjugation. And uh, if you do u u, it says u u equal to u u star. So what does that mean? Something, uh, when is something equal to its complex conjugate? When it's real. So conjugation symmetry guarantees that u u is real, but uh, positivity of norm says it's not just real, it's positive definite. And there's a second property. If some vector has zero norm, that is that, that vector is the zero norm, is the zero vector. This is a very important thing. Lots of proofs make use of this fact. So you want to show that something is zero, but it's some complicated thing. You just go ahead and compute its inner product and show that it is zero. Sometimes that is easier. And then that just uh, the positivity of norm, uh, I mean, implies that u is zero. Okay, so this I already mentioned that condition one for real. So remember, condition one is conjugation symmetry. Condi option uh, condition two is linearity, and third is positivity of norm. Okay, so again, this is something I just said. Uh, the inner product condition one just says it's real, but uh, condition three is stronger. It says it's positive definite. Conditions one and two imply that uh, let's so we can do this. Uh, so we can imp uh, what we can do is. We can go ahead and, uh, you know, exchange the arguments, but there's complex conjugation involved, and because of which A and B come out. So it's almost correct, except that it is, uh, uh, you get a star. So you get A star plus B star. So we call this anti-linear or conjugate linear, because the constants get, complex. I mean, they appear with a complex conjugate. Of course, you can see for real vector spaces, A, a and B are real, so A star equal to A, and so... Is uh, I mean for real vector spaces, uh, it's linear in both arguments. Okay, so again, this is something I just said. If you take v equal to r n or c n, and u will be u one to u n transpose. So if it is r n, u's u i's will be real. If it is c n, u i's will be complex. Okay, and now we'll just define something called u dagger. What is u dagger? So let's look at u. U is a column vector. There's a transpose here. Okay. But u dagger, we'll call this the conjugate transpose of u, is, uh, it, it says the following, u star means you, you take uh, all the elements in u and complex conjugate them. So u1 becomes u1 star, u2 becomes u2 star, and then take a transpose of that. So u transpose, transpose, means the transpose goes away. So u dagger is u1 star, u2 star, un, which is a row vector. Okay. Again, I must say that in math books, the notation dagger is not used. The transpose is implicitly there, and so they just use star. But in physics, we always use this thing, and we read this is dagger. Okay? And so now, 
the inner product is just u dagger v okay so you remember under dagger operation u becomes a row vector v remains a column vector so you can multiply them and get a scalar and if you expand it this is what you get okay again like i said mentioned earlier it's useful to check that this is an inner product in v on cn there might be other inner products okay so a linear vector space with an inner product is called an inner product space so now that we have you know the notion of dot products again we will use uh, you know terminology which we are familiar with with r3 two vectors are said to be orthogonal if an inner product is zero okay so there are nice inequalities so uh, one is called the cauchy schwarz inequality and we'll kind of do we discuss the proof in ps uh, in the next problem set so it just says that the magnitude of the inner product of u and v is less than or equal to the norm of u and norm of v okay so if you look at this in r3 you will realize that uh, u dot v is mod u mod v times cos theta so the mod uh, things cancel and this just becomes modulus of cos theta less than or equal to 1 where theta is the angle between the vectors u and v this is something which we know so this is just a generalization of that again a triangle inequality again this says that if you have you know a triangle with sides u v and u plus v you know how you can form that in r3 and uh, so this is similar to that it just says that mod of u norm of u plus norm of v is greater than or equal to norm of the sum of the two vectors again we will give a proof in Uh, proof in problem set 13. In fact, Cauchy-Schwarz inequality implies triangle inequality, and maybe the other other way around also. But now comes an interesting thing. We have an inner product. So if you give me a vector, because we have an inner product, we will get a linear function. So how does that work? So you take the inner product and put v into the first entry. Now the for to get a so now any time you give me a second vector u. if i put it into the second entry like here you get a function so you can see that we can think of this quantity as a linear as a map it is linear because uh, the inner product is linear in its second argument by definition okay so this becomes a linear map so this is something which uh, uh, we didn't we couldn't do if there was no inner product so this is something very nice so it says that if you have inner product if you give me a vector v i can give you a linear map so the uh, this says that these two are the same in some sense okay so now again we will borrow things which we know that uh, that uh, we can define uh, orthonormal basis like we did in uh, r3 in fact we had different uh, if we change coordinate systems we had different uh, you know basis vectors but every time we did that we made sure that they were orthonormal okay so let's uh, and, uh, so recall that without an inner product linear independence was the only condition imposed on a basis set in an inner product space we have extra structure and we can do better so we impose two extra conditions on the basis we can impose again okay. so the basis here is e1 e2 to en because it has a dimension n so there are n linearly independent vectors orthogonality that means e i e j Uh, e i e j is zero for all i not equal to j, and uh, and e i e a is one. So this is normalized to one. So equivalent to e i e j, there should be delta i j Kronecker delta. So that we just mix these two, put these conditions together. I'll fix this in the slides that I put up on the net later. We will call such a basis an orthonormal, or for short, O n basis. Given a basis. not necessarily on there's an iterative procedure to construct an on on basis and this is called the gram schmidt normal orthonormalization process you may have already seen this in your maths course though in the context of real vector spaces in fact the word vector space i think was not used in your course okay so i'll be a little quick here because you have already seen this elsewhere so we begin with a basis e1 e2 to en which is just uh, all we have here is that e1 to en are linearly independent and it's you know it's not orthonormal so what we will do is we will do an iterative procedure uh, such that uh, after n steps we achieve a new basis 
which you put a hat here just to remind us of what we used to do in R3 and we get a bunch of vectors E1 hat, E2 hat up to E n hat which are orth orthonormal. So first step you pick. So again this is not a unique procedure, it depends the way I am doing it, it depends on the ordering. So suppose you exchange E2 with E1 and it's still the same basis, but you will get a different orthonormal basis. So the ordering matters in this for what you get at the end, but doesn't matter. I think all we are interested in is getting an orthonormal basis. So you first start, pick the first guy E1 and uh, there is, uh, and just normalize it. It's not, it may not be normalized, so you divide by its norm and get E1 hat. So E1 hat is normalized to unity. Next step is take the second guy E2 prime and now our goal uh, E2 and construct from it E2 prime. What is our goal? What is uh, our property of E2 prime? E2 prime is should be orthogonal to E1. That's all we'll worry about when we're doing the prime. Then we'll worry about normalization at the end. So what do we do? So we, uh, if you uh, just think about in R3, well, suppose you have an arbitrary vector and you get and you want you want to look at the component of that vector which is normal to that vector so what do you do you subtract out the you project out the component so let's look at this guy this just draw gets you the component of e2 along e1 so that's what this is so what we are doing here is subtracting it out from e2 so e2 prime has no component along e1 by construction so you can easily check that uh, e this, this should be e1 uh, e1 hat e2 prime is 0. Please check this. It's very easy. And, you know, because in complex things, the basis is, uh, you, it's not symmetric. So you've got to be a little careful about what this is. So here I've got the ordering, right? So, uh, so you can check this. And now e2 prime may not be normalized. So you just normalize it. So at this stage, what do we have? We have two vectors, e1 hat and e2 hat, which are normalized and orthogonal to each other. So, Let's just jump and go to some i-th step uh, where i is greater than 2 because we have done up to 2 here. So i can be 3 but we can keep going. So define ei prime and you keep subtracting out all components along e hat j's for all j's less than or equal to i. So, it be, uh, so you have at this point you have e1 hat, e2 hat, etc, etc up to e hat i minus 1. And you are trying to construct E i prime, which is orthogonal to all the i minus one uh, orthonormal vectors, and we are subtracting all those things out. So by construction again, you can check this E i prime is orthogonal to all E j for j less than i. Then you just diff again normalize it and do, and you get add it to this set. So by now we have at the end of this step we have we have i vectors. Of uh, each of which are orthogonal to each other and each are normalized to unity. So of course at the end of the nth step we update the required orthonormal basis. Now I have worked out an example here and uh, I will just uh, not discuss this but leave it out here so that uh, you can pause your video and check my calculations and hopefully I have not made mistakes. Okay. Now I am doing this for R3 but uh, as we know this can also be a basis for C3 and so now question is is this uh, an orthonormal basis for C3 and just uh, you think about it answer is yes so now we will move on to Dirac notation which is uh, very commonly used in physics and uh, especially in quantum mechanics so Paul A. and Adrian Maurice Dirac won the Nobel 13, 1933 Nobel Prize in physics and he contributed immensely to the development of quantum mechanics and quantum electrodynamics. There's a famous equation called the Dirac equation. You also introduced a notation that is used to this day in quantum mechanics. So just think of this as some uh, table, you know, and uh, don't think too much beyond it. So if you give me vectors u and v, uh, u and v, little v in this vector space, he just writes them as, uh, he puts this uh, bar and this uh, kind of arrowish kind of thing and uh, similar thing. So, the, so these two are supposed to be the same. So if you, uh, if you want to go backwards, you just drop these guys. Okay, drop the extra appendages. This is read as a ket u, and ket v, and so on. Okay, so that's how you do this thing. Now we remember because we are in a product space, we also have. If you give me vectors u and v, there are linear maps u and v, 
and he writes them as the mirror image of it in some sense and these are read as bra you and bra we and so so on so forth so uh, so uh, given two vectors u and v in an inner product space he is able to come up with two objects one he calls a ket u and a ket v and the other which is called a bra u and bra v from our viewpoint ket u and ket v are just the usual vectors while bra v and bra u are the linear maps which are there because we have an inner product so now if you have an inner product uv is just written as in this uh, notation as uv so it just means uh, if you replace the comma with this uh, vertical bar okay that's all you have to do so you know in the next transparency you will see some formulae written in this fashion and all you have to do if you are getting confused is to drop the bar and replace it with a comma okay dirac invented the names bra and ket as a breaking up of what he called a bracket which is what he called the inner product okay so now we can do change of basis so now let b which is e1 to e2 to en now i am using dirac notation just for uh, uh, you know just so that you get used to the notation but if you feel uncomfortable just ignore these extra appendages similarly prime basis both of them are now orthonormal orthonormality what does it imply it means says the inner product of ei with ej and e prime with e, ej prime is delta ij the canonical delta and recall that these two bases in the general case were related by an invertible matrix and i'm just writing it out now again in dirac notation again if you wish you can get rid of this uh, extra stuff and write the, it's the standard thing so let's call this equation star so this is something which we had before but now the additional condition is that ei and the e primes are orthonormal bases so we can go ahead and take inner product with ek prime so let's do that if you do that on the left hand side you just get ek prime ei and let's see what happens on the right hand side so this is the you know, vector so it will be inner product of ek prime with ej prime but that we know is delta kj sj and so we can catch this is just the id in matrix language is identity so this just becomes uh, this, you carry out the summation k become uh, it just corresponds to replacing j with k so it's ski so we get a nice formula which says that ski is the inner product of ek prime with ei we can also do one more thing we can take inner product with the other basis guy ek and we get delta ki which is ek ei so that's just this statement so the left hand side now is easy let's see what this becomes this becomes ek ej prime uh, okay and so now let's just look at this this is not quite this guy but uh, you can see because the prime guy here is the first entry while the prime guy here is the second entry so this you can this actually is just a complex conjugate transpose or the conjugate transpose of this matrix we just call that s dagger kj so what we get in matrix language is that this is s dagger dot s okay so s dagger here is just taking this matrix s complex conjugate of it and taking its transpose that's what this is the kth i element so now we will revisit these two equations i'll rewrite it again so just so this is the first equation it said that ski equal to e prime k ei so i'm just reversing the order and writing it out okay so if you take now complex conjugation of this you get s star ki if you take star of this it means exchange the two orders you get ei ek prime which is what which is analogous to what we got here and this is uh, nothing but what we call s dagger and if you notice here what i've done is i've exchanged the k and i indices so this is the transposition which is involved and that is a definition of s dagger now the second condition is very easy to write the canonical delta is nothing but identity matrix again writing it in reverse order s dagger s is identity or s dagger is the inverse of s okay i n here is just the n by n so what we find is what was originally just uh, in this situation before we put in orthonormality was just an arbitrary matrix is a matrix which satisfies this condition and these matrices which satisfy this condition are called unitary matrices so changes of basis that map one orthonormal basis to another orthonormal basis are thus called a unitary change of basis easy things to show is the magnitude of determinant of s is one just take determinant of this expression 
You can also easily check that the determinant, uh, the product of your two unitary matrices is also unitary. And uh, physically, this just means that if you have two unitary matrices, so you can follow, you know, let's say S1 is one change of basis and S2, we can do them. If you compose them, it still remains a change of basis. And so that it just follows, but you can prove it mathematically as well. So now we get something very nice. Remember, if T was a linear operator, which is something of interest to a map from V to itself, then we, we did some complicated manipulation to get a matrix of that thing, but in this, uh, and that's what we call TKJ. But if your basis is orthonormal, that's a very, very simple expression for the matrix of T. And so let me just go through this. So uh, this was the formula which we got. T of Ej is equal to summation over Kk equal to 1 to n, the dimension of the vector space, Ek tkj. So this is the definition in terms of the tkj. And so uh, how do you get tij? We can take the inner product of this with ei. Okay. And if we do that, what we get is ei ek is, uh, is delta ki. It's a chronicle delta because we have an orthonormal basis. And so it simplifies to just this term. Just simple calculation. I request you to do it. If you are uncomfortable with Dirac notation, do it without. And this in Dirac notation is just written as ket e, uh, ke, bra ei. You insert the t t acts to the right on the ket ej. So this is just short form for this. The operator t dagger is defined as follows. So you take u of t of v. It's just t of uh, so t is some linear map. It can act on any vector and take its complex conjugate. So from just the rules of inner product, it just says exchange the two orbits, and we just did that, T of V and U. Now this defines, what you want to do is you take this T and you want to make it act on V, and this is just definition of this object called D tag. All this is complicated, but you can just simply see, go, uh, choose U to be EI and V to be EJ in some orthonormal basis, and then you will observe that T dagger is nothing but the conjugate transpose of the matrix for T. So what does it say? You, if you know the matrix for T, take its complex conjugate and then transpose. Again, maths books use the symbol T star because for them, transposition is obvious. Okay, so a linear operator T is Hermitian if T equal to T dagger. So Hermitian operators are very, very important because uh, what we will see in quantum mechanics is that uh, observables, things which we measure, will be related to linear operators and observables are usually real and so the eigenvalues of Hermitian shear matrices are real. So that's the key property and so such operators play a very very important role in quantum mechanics. So I'll finish here with two examples, one of unitary matrices and um, about uh, Hermitian matrices. We we'll stick to two by two because we can write general formulae. So I will not discuss this. You can just go ahead and all you're supposed to do is to check that this is a unitary matrix. So it has two complex numbers and one phase. The most general 2 by 2 matrix is a linear combination of the identity matrix and the follow three, following three Hermitian matrices called poly matrices. So it is sigma 1 or sigma x, which is, uh, you can see this is, uh, it's a real entry, so uh, Hermitian is the same as symmetric, so it is 0, 1, this thing. Similarly, sigma z is 1 minus 1, sigma 3 or sigma z, again it's real and it is symmetric. But sigma 2 or sigma y is complex, so there's a complex conjugation, and you can check that this is omission. And the interesting thing is, along with identity, there are only everything, every general Hermitian matrix can be written as a linear combination of these four guys. Okay, so I'll end this lecture here, and uh, uh, so we will now move on to doing physics. We'll, uh, we will start looking at a particular very important experiment called the stern interpretation, and that is a, uh, that will lead us to the birth of quantum mechanics.